doing the introduction. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. We're so excited to be here with you tonight. Um, this evening, we have a super exciting panel lineup for you all. Um, tonight, we are talking uh, the last in our series of COVID and um, cardiovascular disease. But tonight, we're going to hear real stories from heart patients and caregivers about COVID and heart disease. So before we get started, I just want to introduce Mended Hearts if you're new to us. Mended Hearts' mission is to inspire hope and improve the quality of life for heart patients and their families through ongoing peer-to-peer -peer support, education, and advocacy. You can find us all over the web, um, mendedhearts.org, mendedlittlehearts.org, myheartvisit.org, and all of the social media channels. We also have a heart line that you can get in touch with a visitor who is accredited, who can be there to support you in peer-to-peer -peer ways. So if you're looking for support, please reach out. Before we begin, all attendees are in listen-only mode. If you can't hear, hopefully you can read my slide and check the audio button on your personal computer to assure the sound is on. Please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. Questions will be read and answered after the discussion today. Um, we do have Dr. Robin with us to this evening, but just note that he cannot answer specific questions about you as a patient or as your, for your child because he's not your treating physician. There will be not, won't be slides tonight, so, but the recording of the webinar will be available online. And I do have Dr. Robin with me. I think we're having a little bit of technical difficulties with his computer or with his camera. Um, but Dr. Jason Robin is a director of cardio oncology and sports cardiology at North Shore University Health System. Um, and he is a clinical associate professor of medicine at the University of Chicago Pritzker School of Medicine. And the exciting people that everybody wants to hear from this evening, I'm sure we have Catherine Case Larson, who is an adult congenital heart patient. We have Marlon Taylor, who is an adult heart patient. Minty Rosen House, who is also an adult heart patient. We have Stephanie Ritchie, who is a parent of a child with congenital heart disease. And they are here with us. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen because we don't want to see that. We want to see all of you all. Thank you so much for being here. Um, Dr. Robin, can you hear me? Maybe not. All of those. Hello, I definitely hear you. I'm just working on trying to get my video going. Okay, no problem. Well, why don't we start with a round of introductions while we're waiting? <clears throat> why don't we start with the people that are on my screen first? Stephanie, would you mind introducing yourself and just give us just a real quick brief background of your journey? My name is Stephanie Ritchie, and I am the director of uh, Mendel Little Hearts in Colorado Springs. I have a, an 11 year old heart patient. Um, he was diagnosed almost one month to the day before his first birthday um, with a coarctation of the aorta, a bicuspid and a bicuspid aortic valve. Um, he had, that was October 5th of 2000. 11 and he had um, his co-op repair December 13th of that same year and then a little bit later down the road um, we found out that he also has an enlarged left coronary artery um, so far he's been doing great um, after the repair and um, we did all contract COVID at the beginning of October just this past October um, he was the only unvaccinated member of our family that got it because he was too young. Great. Thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. Minty, how about you? Well, I, I serve both as a heart patient and a caretaker. Okay. Um, caregiver. A 
caregiver, my wife, correctly. Uh, my, my wife uh, had, uh, she and I both shared uh, mitral valve prolapse. Uh, I've had it since I'm an infant and the doctors described it to my parents when I was about three months old as a functional heart murmur. Don't worry about it. But the cardiologist seemed to worry about it every six months. Uh, but 71 years, it's been pretty much okay. Marilyn had hers uh, repaired about eight years ago. Nine. Nine years ago now. And unfortunately, she went into cardiogenic shock during the repair. So that kind of scared us. And the few, we, we, we share diseases. We both contracted COVID on September 24th last year, a year ago, September. She was okay. She had a, a bad cold. I wound up with a uh, pulse ox of about 67. And my friend, the pulmonologist, told me, go to the nurse emergency room. And that was the worst nine days of my life. <laughs> oh, and we're so thankful you're here with us. Yeah, and I, unfortunately, I've come out with the uh, long-term COVID from it. Well, we're looking forward to listening to some details of but that. So far, your heart hasn't been affected that we know of. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's great. Marlon, how about you? Um, I'm, my name is Marlon Taylor. I am a uh, former uh, um, ARD, uh, which is an assistant regional director and a former regional director Right now, I'm serving as president of the chapter uh, in the local area and uh, do visiting. Um, in um, uh, 2007, uh, we had a house fire. And uh, uh, at that time, I uh, told a neighbor that I wasn't feeling very well because we just exited the house. It was cold and whatever. And uh, he told the paramedics and they uh, threw uh, some leads on me. And the uh, quote was, you do know that I should take you to the hospital, don't you? And um, I, I answered yes, which is, a, uh, is, is something that I rarely do when it comes to going to hospitals and that sort of thing. But uh, the upshot is that I ended up on um, January uh, uh, 26th having a, um, uh, five-way uh, cabbage. Uh, and aside, uh, someone from Mended Hearts had come in and visited me on Christmas Day. And uh, that inspired me so much that that's why I got involved with the uh, uh, organization. Somewhere in 2014, about one o'clock in the morning, I woke up um, with a centipede dance uh, uh, that had broken out in, in, in my chest. Uh, and um, um, my first thought was to panic. And, uh, but then I remembered a pamphlet that I had gotten from Mended Heart that said, living with AFib. And I said, ah, living with AFib, you can live. I'll just go back to sleep and take care of this in the morning, uh, which is uh, what I did. And um, I have um, always had a generally slow heart rate lived for um, um, most of the time uh, with a heartbeat uh, in the 40s somewhere. Uh, one day I was working on the computer and uh, um, I, I just got this dizzy feeling and um, um, uh, went and took my blood pressure and, um, um, and my uh, heart rate at that time was uh, 30 beats a, 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 a minute. So um, uh, being the uh, procrastinator that I am, I uh, called the doctor the next day and uh, talked to the nurse and they said, well, if this ever happens again, call us right away. And then in the afternoon, I got a call back and said, you're scheduled for a pacemaker tomorrow at <laughs> such and such a time. I said, that's very inconvenient. And she repeated, you're scheduled for a pacemaker tomorrow at two o'clock. And so that's the um, uh, th three basic uh, things that I deal with in terms of, um, uh, of heart conditions. Fabulous. Well, thank you for sharing. And Catherine. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Catherine Case Larson. I live in Austin, Texas. And I was born in 1955 with uh, aortic stenosis and atrial septical defect. 
course, then at that time, it was pretty scary to my parents. But in 1965, I had my first open heart surgery, and that was to repair the aortic stenosis with a patch that they put in. And life went on for a number of years. And in 2002, after I moved to Austin in 2000, new to Austin somewhat, new cardiologist and everything, and he turned me on to a phenomenal surgeon. And I had, um, in 2002, I had to have the um, St. Jude mechanical heart valve put in because at the time I was 47, so they didn't want to do a pig valve. So I live with an aortic, you know, mechanical valve and I'm great, you know, and I've been involved with mended hearts and mended little hearts since 2003, before mended little hearts was around. But anyway, that's <laughs> my life and everything's great. Well, thank you for joining us. We're really excited to have this panel together. And we do have Dr. Robin. I know that he can hear us and talk to us. And we're sorry that the video is not working. Um, we are trying I, to- I see, I see all of your beautiful faces. I see everyone's face. Well, great. So please um, introduce yourself and we can just talk like that. Okay, sounds good. So it'll be more like a radio show, I guess. There you go. All right. So yeah, my name is Jason Robin, and I've been at North Shore since 2009. I'm a Chicagoan. I did all of my training at Northwestern between 2002 and 2009. Just never found a city that I loved as much as Chicago, so I just never left the city. I grew up in the Chicagoland area as well. I love the University of Illinois Fighting Illini. I love the Cubs, the Bulls, the Bears, um, and that's... Uh, that, those are my those are my passions outside of uh, cardiology, of course. I've got three kids that are 15, 13, and 11, and uh, it certainly has been challenging or was challenging for that year and a half period where my kids were at home doing home learning, and my kids are all athletes, so it was definitely a bummer for them not to be able to participate in sports for about six to nine months or so. Um, my one, I have two main focuses at uh, North Shore. Well, I should say three main focuses. So one is I'm a structural heart guy. So what that means is I'm very involved in the minimally invasive procedures that uh, take into consideration fixing aortic valves and mitral valves, fixing holes in the heart, but doing so without having to open up the chest. And in addition to that, I am the director of cardio oncology at North Shore. And what essentially what that means is that patients who are going through treatments for their various malignancies, I make sure that these treatments are not negatively impacting the heart. And I make sure that if there is any negative impaction on the heart, it's not going to affect their treatment because the treatments that we have for cancer these days are incredible. I see patients who have widespread disease, you put them on immunotherapy or targeted therapy and everything gets wiped away, their PET scans turn normal. Fortunately, sometimes it is at the, um, uh, the heart takes a beating with it. So what I do is I make sure that the heart, that there's any issues, it's detected early on. And one of the, uh, one of the complications that we see in cardio-oncology is something called myocarditis. So one of the treatments that's used for certain malignancies, such as uh, some forms of breast cancer, melanoma, renal cell carcinoma, colon cancer, lung cancer, we give a drug that accelerates the immune system. And what it does is it uh, causes the immune system to attack the tumor and get rid of the tumor. However, in some patients, in about 1% to 2% of patients, the immune system is revved up it can actually cause inflammation of the heart itself. And that's called myocarditis. And I've had an interest in myocarditis for a number of years. And because of my interest in myocarditis, I got very involved with COVID because one of the main concerns with COVID when it first came out was the potential high risk of myocarditis, which is an inflammation of the heart muscle. So for that reason, uh, in early uh, to mid 2000, we started a, uh, a sports cardiology program initially simply based for kids, athletes who had had COVID and there was concern about them returning to sports because we didn't want them to return to sports if their heart was inflamed. And this caught a lot of press uh, nationwide and 
in the Big Ten, which is where we live now, but even out in the Pac-10, out in the West Coast, every kid, every student athlete who had COVID had to get a cardiac MRI done. And so now we have a lot of data on what the true incidence of myocarditis is with COVID and what the risks are, et cetera. So happy to think about that as we uh, as we. Great. Well, thank you. So let's get started. Thanks, everybody, for introducing. Um, I know that Dr. Robin has some questions. Um, I know that you all did your introductions and had some, um, everybody here has experienced COVID in one way or the other. Um, and that's what we really want to get down and talk about this evening. Um, some busting some myths, maybe. Um, you know, is it as scary as everybody says? Um, is it scarier? What do we need to look for? Uh, how can we, I mean, we know how to protect ourselves, but if we get COVID, how do we protect ourselves as heart patients? And so we're looking to you all because you're the experts tonight. Um, and I know that Dr. Robbins is logging back on to hopefully fix his, his audio and uh, video. But bef before we get started or while we're waiting on him, I'd just like to know I know everybody obviously had an okay outcome. Minty, you said you were having some long-term COVID effects. Um, anybody else have long-term COVID effects that they're still experiencing now? Nope. Yes. Yes? No. Okay. Um, and Stephanie, you said your son um, is got COVID as well as the whole family as the heart as a congenital heart patient, did he experience it worse than you all or? No, that was kind of the interesting thing. He was, so there's four of us, myself, my husband, and then we have a 13 year old heart healthy child. And then Ian is our 11 year old um, cardiac patient. He was the first one to get it. And he started, do you want me to start with how it started? Sure. Yeah, that'd okay. be great. He kind of, um, strangely enough, my mom who lives in Ohio, we weren't near each other at all. She actually got it at the same time as we did. Um, and we had been camping and Ian got a nosebleed. My mom also started with a nosebleed. So I think it was that rise in the blood pressure. Um, and he typically gets, he also has allergy induced asthma. So in the fall, we kind of watch um, and he started coughing and we started nebulizing right away because that's just what we do. Um, so I think the nebulizing treatments really kind of helped keep his lungs open and it did not go to his lungs. Other than that, um, both of my kids, um, my vaccinated and unvaccinated, both of their heart rates were about double um, for the first 48 hours. Um, as a heart mom, you learn how to take um, all of your vitals real real quick. <laughs> and so I was taking vitals um, pretty regularly. And for those first 48 hours, their heart rate was up. Um, my daughter's was about 148. Ian's got in the 120s for a while. Um, and that was resting. And um, so that was probably the scariest part. Other than that, um, both kids just wound up more like a cold, um, a little bit of cough. He had a lingering cough for several weeks. Um, but I think that was more due to the, the asthma kind of effects of it. Um, other than that, a couple days of feeling meh and he, and he did, he did pretty well. Great. Great. And it's okay, Dr. Robin, we know you're there and, um, we're sorry, we can't see you, but we're, I just had them all kind of start with how their journey started. Um, and I ask if anybody had any long-term effects. Uh, Minty and Marlon both said they do. And so that's where we're at. If you, do you have questions? Yeah, I do for Stephanie. So Stephanie, you're, it's your 11 year old that was born with coarctation, is that correct? Correct, yes. Okay, and also a bicuspid valve or just coarctation of the aorta? Yep. And a bicuspid valve, yep. Okay. And what was, what intervention has he had to this point? Um, he had a co repair um, when he was 13 months old. So that was all. Okay. So they dilated his aorta at that time. 
Um, actually, they did the, um, they, Dr. Glanowitz in, at Nationwide Children's in Columbus did his surgery. Um, and so he went in through his back and they actually just cut out the pinch point and then were able to put the ends together. Got it, got it. So with, with kids or adults for that matter with uh, congenital heart disease, overall they do, they've done very, very well with COVID. There is one group of kids, though, that I do get a little bit more concerned with, and yours is not one of them, but one of the types of congenital kids that I uh, get concerned about are those who have what are called baffles. And baffles are conduits, okay, that we create when people have such tight narrowings of their valves or such tight narrowings of their arteries. And we, we use baffles in people who have very complex okay. congenital heart disease, such as the trilogy of Fallot or tricuspid atresia. And my concern with COVID in this group is that one of the concerns we have with COVID is the risk of blood clotting. That's one of the things that we saw early on with COVID is we're seeing a large number of people who are developing pulmonary emboli. And that's why in the hospital, people who came in with COVID were immediately put on anticoagulation. So I do have a patient who's about 19 years old, goes to the University of Missouri with complex congenital heart disease, has had multiple surgeries during the first five years of his life. And this was before the vaccine was available to him. He wanted to go down to Missouri and be a freshman in college. And I certainly did have some concern about him going down there with these conduits, because if one of these conduits were to clot off, that could potentially be a very, very big problem. He was 19, and he said, listen, I want to go and be a freshman in college. I said, well, if you're going to go down there, you're going to wear the N95 all the time. So he did that, and he actually went through his entire uh, freshman year at Missouri. Had, uh, think, thankfully, had no issues at all, and now he is double vaccinated, and he's doing just fine. But in general, in general for the congenital patients, such as those with amputation or bicuspid aortic valves or mitral valve prolapse, things such as that, not as concerned with the COVID. Great. That's, it's, that's great to hear as a mom of a child with a congenital heart defect. Um, Marlon, can you share a little bit about the beginning of your journey um, and how your experience with COVID was and what were your concerns going into it as a heart patient? Um, mine was uh, pretty much a roller coaster ride uh, and um, very quickly, uh, it started, I'll just start in January. Uh, we were wearing masks. We didn't go out. We thought we were doing everything properly. Um, we'd go out to uh, buy groceries or something like that. And uh, just, um, um, I was walking uh, 30, 40, up to 80 minutes a day on the treadmill and everything was great. And then towards the end of the month, everything just started to collapse. And by the um, um, middle of uh, February, uh, I was uh, pretty much uh, to a point where I didn't even want to get out of bed. Um, I had no uh, zest for life, no energy whatsoever. So uh, that's when I uh, went to the hospital and spent um, seven days there. Um, the problem that I had then was, um, uh, quite frankly, I, I call it brain fog or uh, COVID brain or whatever you want to call it. But um, um, uh, I anything that I knew or learned it just kind of disappeared. And um, uh, it would go in one ear and out of the other. It was sort of like in my mind, I would walk into a room and there'd be empty, uh, uh, nothing there. And so I spent seven days in the hospital and they treated me and I came out. Um, as it happened, my wife had COVID at the same time and she was in the hospital for four days. So we kind of came out and said, well, we made an agreement we'd take care of ourselves, but not necessarily very much of each other. And uh, that, that, that worked really well because neither one of us really had that great an energy. I started feeling a lot better and I thought, ah, oh, this is great. This is not as big a deal as, uh, uh, as everyone says. And um, in um, um, uh, April, it was just like a, a total collapse. And I ended up back in the hospital for um, seven days. I was treated this time for pneumonia, uh, COVID. Um, uh, I ended up having a, um, a 
two units of, um, of blood. And it was the uh, blood uh, transfusion that uh, started me on the path to uh, uh, really starting to feel better. Uh, when, uh, but they had a lot of trouble with uh, 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 glucose control. And so they were, you know, constantly, constantly the stab, the test, and then uh, um, uh, insulin. And I kept telling them, you know, that's not my, I, that, that, that's, that's not me. That's not what goes on in my life. And uh, they assured me that everything was okay until one day I woke up with a, um, oh, I think it was about 38 uh, reading. And then it was um, uh, uh, the uh, uh, sugar water or whatever it is they give you to uh, bring you back. Uh, when I got out, they sent me home with a lancet pen. I took one uh, a shot of it uh, at night, which I was supposed to do uh, twice a day, uh, two units. And I woke up in the middle of the night with a, a, a blood sugar reading down uh, around 30. And um, um, I crawled out of bed and got myself downstairs, did did a, a couple of bananas and uh, apple juice until I recovered, called the doctor and said, never again will I take this. I told you I don't need it. Now, now I have blood sugar readings in the morning of about 83 on uh, five um, uh, milligrams of uh, uh, glyphosate. And uh, um, so th that covered the bad thing. And, and do you want to get into some after effects? Yeah, I think we will, but I just kind of, I think let's stick with actually at COVID and then we'll go on to the after effects, I think would be great. Okay. Um, but you had time, a journey, didn't you? The, 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 second, the second time, the second time uh, when all of this collapse was taking place, I had chest pains. So another part of the treatment in the hospital was a, uh, uh, um, a nitroglycerin patch that I wore to keep the uh, chest discomfort at bay. And um, I had extreme shortness of breath. Um, you know, when I was getting into it, uh, the extreme shortness of breath wasn't necessarily when I exercised. When I exercise, I get heart pain, but I, I mean chest pain, but I wasn't breathing hard. Um, and uh, I would wake up in the middle of the night and it would be, <gasps> type of a, a, a feel. And so uh, all of that, uh, the uh, nebulizer uh, and uh, uh, that uh, sort of thing was part of the, part of the treatment too. So um, uh, after seven days, I got out and we'll pick up on the rest of the story later. Wow, what a journey. Catherine, how about you? Can you give us a little story of how it worked with you and you'll have to unmute. Yeah, it was really interesting. I went to see my cardiologist who I'd seen for 20 years in October. And I said to him, Dr. Morris, I said, do I need to really, really worry about this heart? You know, about my heart and COVID because I am a congenital person and not a quote disease necessarily. He said, no. So he said, you have a structural defect that you were born with. You just need to take care of yourself and do all the precautions, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what I did. So all of a sudden on December 6th, I went to the doctor on the 5th and results came in on 6th that I had COVID. Well, I went to the doctor because on Tuesday I started coughing and I coughed so hard. It was annoying and it was just, you know, constant. And so when she tested me, I said, why are you doing that? She goes, well, you might have COVID. And I went, what? So anyway, so I had it. I'd been out to dinner with some friends in Austin, Texas, sitting outside in November. I think it was the day before election 2020 and sat next to a lady. And I called all the ladies at the table, including her on Friday when I determined that I, well, it was told that I had COVID. And she said, oh, I have 102 fever and I'm this, that, and the other. And I'm like, oh my God. So I must've gotten it from her, but whoever knows where you get it exactly. Cause we did all the precautions. Anyway, my biggest thing was cough. I had a cough 
Um, I took medicine for a couple of weeks. I had a headache. I slept upstairs because I didn't want to give it to my husband, but then he had a test and he had it too. But he had, I had fever one night and my husband had fever two nights. So we were pretty much, it was a relatively smooth thing. And with my heart deal, only thing I had really was a cough. That was, and a headache, which I don't usually get, but that was it for me. And because it was structural, I felt a little bit more at ease that it wasn't going to be what took me <laughs> because at 97.5% chance you'll live. And even though I had an underlining possibly thing, it was more structural than it was disease. So I made it through. I have no after effects. And I just want to throw something in. My 90 year old father at Christmas, this was in November, we went to see him and he ended up with COVID, but he went to the hospital for something else and they determined he had COVID. He never had a day of fever. Wow. It's amazing the difference between people um, with the same disease. And Dr. Robin, I know you're still with us, I think, I hope. Um, how yeah. about any questions um, to the panelists on their experience? Um, now that we've listened to a little bit of their journey. Yeah, so Marlon, you certainly had quite a journey. And um, I, I have a question for you. When you were hospitalized with the COVID pneumonia in April, did they put you on any steroids during that time period? Yes, they did. Yeah. So you know, even without steroids, it's very common for people who have significant pneumonia or a COVID infection to develop very high blood sugars because all of the stress hormones in your body are being uh, secreted. So uh, hormones such as adrenaline and cortisol, these are things that increase the sugar in your body. So when you're running from a bear, okay, these stress hormones are released and that causes your blood sugar to go up so that way your body has more energy. So it's very common in the hospital to have high blood sugars in the setting of infection. And then steroids also increase your blood sugars as well. And we know that in the setting of any sort of infection, it's always good for the person to be as close to euglycemic as possible. In other words, have their blood sugars as close to normal as possible. So there's plenty of people who never get a diagnosis of diabetes, but while they're in the hospital with uh, steroids or just very, very sick, will give them short-term uh, glucose lowering agents like insulin. And clearly in this instance, they overshot it a little bit. And it's, I, I've had low blood sugars myself. It's a terrible feeling, um, but I'm, I'm glad you're, so now you're just taking a little bit of lipizide and it seems to be working well for you. So I'm happy to hear that your sugars are so well controlled. And Catherine, I, um, I hear your story. Now again, you had the bicuspid aortic valve with the mechanical valve that was uh, placed uh, what, over two decades ago, correct? Oh, well, in um, December 18th, it'll be 19 years. That's right, almost two, two 19 decades. years. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So I have a mechanical yeah. valve and I take Coumadin, or now I have to take Warfarin, which is the pits. Well, if we have time, I'll tell you the story about Warfarin, how it came to be. But for right now, oh, I'll tell you a couple yeah. things. So you, you're, you're absolutely right that for someone with your sort of congenital heart condition, I would not have considered you to be at very high risk per se. The people uh, with underlying heart disease that I was most worried about are people who have diabetes and people who have extensive coronary artery disease, simply because with COVID, there's the risk of these clots forming. And when you already have a tight artery, you're at increased risk for clot to form. And we know that people with diabetes, they tend to have different types of blood vessels than people without diabetes. Their blood vessels are usually a little bit thinner, um, not as wide. So it's easier for these clots to form within these tiny blood vessels, whether they be tiny blood vessels in the lungs or tiny blood vessels in the heart. And that's a rule, that's a reason, I'm sorry, why people with diabetes tend to get a little bit sicker when they have COVID. And believe it or not, I'm going to tell you, Catherine, that that mechanical valve that you have could be one of the reasons that you did so well with the COVID because you're already on blood thinner. So you didn't have to worry. So this, it, it, was a, it was a great thing to have. It, it might have saved your life. Well, can I throw something in? So I uh, had 
difficult situation the first of 2021 with my father becoming ill for something else in New Orleans. And so I live in Austin. I had to go over there. Well, I happened to be home for just like five days. And I told my husband who was getting the Moderna vaccine and everything, I said, well, I really think I just need to see if I have antibodies. So I called my doctor's office. They said, come in Friday. Well, all of a sudden on Thursday, my phone rang and they said, Catherine, have you and Mr. Larson had um, your vaccines? I said, well, he's going through Moderna, but we have the J&J &J here. And I worked for them. I was in medical and surgical sales for 23 years. So I said, okay, well, that's the one I want anyway, the J&J. &J. So I went and had it. Um, th that day at two o'clock, I said, when can I get it? And they said, here. So I was like, okay, I'll get it. And then because I heard all this stuff about blood clots, I was like, well, maybe it's good that I'm on COVID because I'm not getting a clot. But the interesting thing is, and I just want to throw this out now because I think it'd be interesting for you to know, Dr. Robin, is I had a uh, annual test for Medicare and they tested me for antibodies. I have plenty of antibodies. Here I am. October, it was the end of October. I had COVID in November last year, November 6th. Shot, I think it was April, J and J. And I have plenty of antibodies. She said, you don't need a booster. So I'm like, okay, good. I don't want to get one. <laughs> so if your if your antibodies are still high, then yeah, you're probably okay. And but isn't that right now the right I'm sorry, go ahead. I said, isn't that interesting that they would be so high that I don't need one and I've had the J&J, &J, which all this recent data that's coming out says, oh, you'll be at this level. But that level, as compared to the percent of someone at my age, which I'm 66, you know, it doesn't seem to be going together, I guess I'd say. Well, what I would say is that it's very unpredictable as yeah. far as who's going to respond with significant antibodies and who is not. So I can tell you that I had the Pfizer vaccine December of 2020, and I had it again in January of 2021, several weeks later. And I had my antibodies checked in August, and I had very few antibodies left at that point. Whereas my mother in law, uh, who was essentially in the same boat, she, and she's in her mid seventies, she had uh, vaccines at about the same time, maybe one month later than me. And I checked her antibodies eight months later and she was higher than the, the machine, higher than the lab even count. So it's just variable why one person. Uh, so when they give these recommendations, it's based in general, but not, not everybody fits that mold. Right. Yeah. So Minty, I know you touched on having some long-term effects of COVID. I know that you had been really sick. Can you just elaborate on what your long-term effects are and what you're seeing? I know you said not your heart. So what are well, you seeing in terms? Well, I know my cardiologist every three months now, he wants me to get camped to the echo because he's convinced I'm going to get myocarditis from this thing. You know, he's still convinced of that part. Uh, but he, he's surprised nothing's happened. Uh, but I have, I can't walk more than a couple hundred feet. I get winded. I have to sleep with oxygen at night. Uh, I suffer from uh, CSF leaks and uh, daily persistent headaches. That was separate from COVID. And, and it, the COVID attacked it so badly. I've been in horrible pain from, from the COVID. And the arthritis has just gotten horrible because of COVID. And those are results of it. Can I say one thing? Because of his COVID post post COVID syndrome stuff, where he's having trouble with the breathing and the fatiguing, we sold our home, a two story house, to move into an apartment building with elevators because he can't do the stairs. It was that wow. dramatic. Yeah, that's yeah. It's it has been a you know, I used to try to be active and do things and go out and meet with people and talk with clients and. I pretty much become, I, I don't go out a lot. I go down to the pool and try to swim some in the apartments here. And it's been a life altering effect, COVID. And my son, who's 40 years old, I said, David, you've got to be real careful. Well, he has long-term COVID too. 
He, I said, Dave, you have to be real careful. He says, well, I'm okay, Dad. But as a kid, he had asthma. And it, you know, he, he ended up raised from his house, got it. And he still has the cough now almost a year later. Mm. I mean, it just, it strikes you very funny. Wow. Dr. Robin? Yeah, it does, Minty. Yeah, yeah, this is a, I'm sorry you can't see me. So, um, but now you certainly you fit the bill for a person. Sorry about that. I, I will tell you this though, as far as the myocarditis is concerned, this far out, I'm not concerned about myocarditis at this point. I mean, we were certainly worried about it in the acute setting, but this long term out, what you're feeling right now. From the COVID is probably more pulmonary in nature than anything. And with COVID, there's a lot of inflammation that can happen in the lungs. And sometimes with that inflammation, you develop some scar tissue. And when there's scar tissue in the airways, it's it just makes things more difficult. It makes it more difficult to breathe. And um, you know, we hope that with time, some of this uh, that that scar tissue might be away a little bit. But the key thing for you is to try to enhance your cardiopulmonary status in any other way possible. So certainly re rehab is a good idea from a cardiovascular perspective, making sure your blood pressure is well controlled, making sure you're on all the right medicines. Um, you know, weight is a very important part of things and try and find a ways to exercise and eat right to take care of the things that you can take care of. Because again, if there is some scar tissue there, there's not much we can do with the scar tissue. But there are other factors that can be contributing to your breathlessness. And one of the things that I see in a lot of patients is just deconditioning. If you're so sick for such a long period of time with the COVID, you become very sedentary. And with the set, it become, when you become more sedentary, especially as we get older, it becomes more difficult to bounce back. And an 18 year old can be on their back for two or three weeks. They could bounce back within a week or two. Whereas as we get older, middle age, elder age, um, it's you know, a, a few weeks in the hospital or a few weeks being sedentary, be months and months before we would recover. Yeah. yeah. That's, um, yeah, uh, Catherine, and it, go ahead, Catherine, and then Minty, and I'm going to ask Stephanie a question after that. Go ahead, Catherine. I have a question, Dr. Robin. I've been concerned about all of these younger patients getting myocarditis at, you know, a teenage level. And then what about the children in that six to 12 year? Um, bracket that they want to give vaccines to and do they really are we I mean from a standpoint you know your structural have everything written down that you said you did and I just wonder are we I mean I don't want to see children like with asthma or whatever end up having this and how do we know if someone's going to have it? is there a test that can be done before they get the vaccine to see if they're going to get the myo Carditis, or which one of the three vaccines would be the best for them to get? So, let me tell you a little <laughs> bit about the, myo the myocarditis story, okay? When, the, when COVID first started, especially in Europe in early 2020, they were taking mostly hospitalized patients, but certainly middle-aged to older patients, and they were doing an MRI of the heart on all of them. And an MRI of the heart is a very expensive and a very sensitive test to pick up myocarditis because what they can see is inflammation of the heart. Right. And that's something that an ultrasound is not going to show. It's something that an electrocardiogram is not going to show. And the truth of the matter is, is that every time you've had a cold in your life, it wouldn't surprise me at all if we did a cardiac MRI that we would have shown some evidence of myocarditis. Mm -hmm. But a paper came out from Germany, maybe March, April, May, of 2020, and it said that about half of these people who had cardiac MRIs who had COVID had evidence of myocarditis. So that's a significant number, 50%. So that is actually the reason why college sports were put on hold and uh, in professional sports as well, because there was such a, a concern for it. So in, co in college sports, in certain conferences, as I mentioned earlier, the Pac-10, the Big Ten, they started doing MRIs on all of their athletes who hit, were COVID positive. And now we're, see, we're seeing numbers like 10 or 15 percent of the kids. But these were very small studies. So Ohio State had a study with 23 kids that were COVID positive. They did an MRI. 
about three out of the 23, which is 15%, had some evidence of myocarditis. It doesn't mean that it was clinically relevant. It was probably more of an incidental finding than anything else. But now, it was just published about two months ago, now we've had tens of thousands of young athletes who have had COVID and have had MRIs. Some of these are high school athletes, some, a lot of them are college athletes. And as it turns out, probably only about one or 2% of healthy young adults who get COVID have MRI evidence of myocarditis. But just because you have MRI evidence of myocarditis doesn't mean that anything bad is going to happen to you. And you know this, you know that if we were seeing young people between the ages of 15 and 25 dropping on the basketball court or dropping on the football field, it would be on the front page of the newspaper. Be on CNN, it would be on Fox. So even though there is a small percentage that does develop myocarditis based on MRI criteria, it's probably not clinically relevant. But I would say that again, if we do an MRI on every single person, we're going to see it maybe 1% of healthy people and maybe 25% or more, maybe 50% of people as they get older. But the clinical relevance of it is unclear. Now, as far as vaccine is concerned, okay. We have a lot of data right now looking at the incidence of myocarditis with the vaccine. And I can tell you right now that if the incidence of myocarditis is 1% with infection, the incidence of myocarditis with the vaccine is in the ballpark of 1 in 10,000 to 1 in 100,000. So it's extremely, extremely rare. Now, this is my specialty. So I've seen it. And I've seen probably about a half a dozen um, you know, young people between the ages of 15 and 30 who have developed myocarditis after the vaccine over the last six months or so. And almost all are men. I do have one patient who is a female, but it's typically men between the ages of 18 and 30 who tend to get a myocarditis. But I can tell you that the incident, when, when people get it after the vaccine, it's a very, very benign course. It's maybe a couple days of chest pain, Maybe their cardiac enzymes are a little bit elevated, but we rest them. We um, sometimes give them anti-inflammatory medications. And so far, every single patient that I've seen, and this goes along with all my colleagues across the country who have treated this group, they've all done fine. There's been no cases of significant morbidity, certainly no cases of mortality from a vaccine-induced myocarditis. Now, your question now is with the kids. Okay, So I have a daughter who's 10 years old. My 15 and 13 year old, they've been, uh, you know, they were vaccinated uh, and got their second dose in the summer. So my daughter just had her first dose of a Pfizer vaccine and she's 10 years old. And I can certainly, trust me, I'm, I'm very pro vaccine. And I can tell you why these, uh, my experience is being in the hospital. When I see patients who are hospitalized with COVID, the one thing, at least today when they're hospitalized with COVID, the one thing that they all have in common you are vaccinated. So if you're vaccinated, I'm not saying you can't get a little sick, you can, but the likelihood of you um, being hospitalized is very close to nothing. So overall, the benefit is in your favor. Now, for young kids, these kids don't get sick with COVID. I mean, these six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 12-year-olds, they may get a little bit of a runny nose, but it's like a nothing. So then we think to ourselves, my goodness, am I going to take, my kid is not going to die from COVID. Okay. But geez, I'm giving them this vaccine. How much research has been done with these young kids? Should I give it? I've given it to my kids. They've all done well. And the reason that I feel like it's a good idea to give it to them is not for my kids, but for their grandparents, their teachers, uh, their teachers' parents, etc. And again, that, that's why I give it to the kids. Not because I'm so worried about them getting sick, but again, this is just another way to help uh, reduce the spread. Great, thank you. Um, Stephanie, one quick question before we go to the audience for questions for everybody. So you have young kids, well, younger kids. Um, how did they do with the whole quarantine? What were your big struggles over the past couple of years? And um, maybe not just about COVID, being sick with COVID, but just the whole situation. Yeah. yeah, I will. I wanted to piggyback on what Dr. Robin said too, real quick for Catherine. So 
that was a concern having an 11 year old boy um, with the vaccine. Um, and our cardiologist said pretty much, you know, the same thing Un unvaccinated myocarditis. Um, if you're going to get it with the disease, you, you can still get it if you get just COVID. And so unvaccinated, they are seeing um, a much greater um, effect of myocarditis. So they get it in a more um, severe way than with the vaccine. So it's more controlled with the vaccine and more easily to look at. But anyway, um, yes. And interestingly, I teach elementary school, <laughs> so second grade teacher. So um, the shutdown, initially was hard on all of us, um, even though I am a trained professional in education, when it is you teaching your own children or helping your own children is very difficult. Um, I have a 13 year old daughter who has um, ADD and anxiety. Um, so that was extremely hard um, to sit and, and for her to not be able to go um, to school and be with her peers um, was extremely difficult. My son, um, did fairly well because he's kind of the kid who's like, let's sit down. I want a goal. I want to get it done and I want to move on. Um, so he was able to kind of, you know, buckle down and, and do what he needed to do as far as the quarantining um, goes. But when we got sick with COVID, our daughter, um, luckily, we have a week long fall break um, in October. And it just so happened that we got it right at the beginning of fall break. So we didn't really have to miss a ton of school or work. Um, but my daughter, we were just kind of watching the days and um, being 13, she was happy to kind of get away from all of us who were sick and she holed up in her room and we would text her and let her know like where we were in the house or, you know, don't come to the kitchen for the next hour or two. We were there and you don't want to go there. Um, but she wound up getting it also. And she wound up getting it at a point where, um, then she had to then miss that next week of school. When we went back, she had to stay home. So that was, hard um, and she was vaccinated. So she was just feeling pretty sour about the fact that, you know, we had done the things that we were supposed to do. We had masked when we were supposed to, we did, we vaccinated when we were supposed to. And yet here we are. Um, and she felt pretty good at that point. So she was ready to go back to school, even though the CDC says, you know, you have to be out for those 10 days. Um, you know, and it was a good point. And I've, I've seen it um, in my own school, in my own um, workplace, that parents um, are sending kids back to school, um, not tested necessarily, but still ill. And so that is very, that's hard. That's concerning um, because we don't know who other people are going home to um, or who they're seeing, you know, if, if they knew, or if people were being more careful, they, maybe they wouldn't choose to go see grandparents or, um, someone who was immunocompromised. So that has been kind of the social aspect has been a little bit rough. Um, just as we're kind of depending on people to do the right thing. And some people, you know, everybody's free to make their own choices. Yeah. So I have two questions lined up for um, Dr. Robin. And then if anybody out there listening has any questions for anybody, any of the panelists, Dr. Robin, please type them into the Q&A box and we will try to get to them. We only have six minutes left. This hour flew by. Um, Dr. Robin, the first question I have is with from someone who has had COVID, if they get the booster, does that help? I'm echoing here. Hold on. Will that help control the long haul symptoms? Like, have you seen or have you heard anybody talk about or data that shows if you're experiencing some long haul symptoms of COVID and you get your booster shot, will that help reduce that long haul syndrome? Well, I've seen uh, quite a few patients with long haul syndrome. I have not seen or read about any data that would suggest that the booster is going to help uh, lessen the symptoms of the long haul. The long haul is the long haul, and there are certain things that we can do, such as physical therapy and um, rehab and whatnot. But no, the booster, it's going to help prevent you from getting it again, which you certainly would like to do if you had such a reaction. But no, it's not going to help lessen your symptoms of the long haul. Symptoms. Okay. 
And then the, the other question is, um, is if a congestive heart failure patient is vaccinated and had the booster, what are some of the risks that a person might be concerned about in regards to being exposed to COVID now? Um, masks are worn, but what about social distancing? Can people go to restaurants in other indoor places safely? Well, okay. So again, just to give some perspective on what I'm seeing in the hospital, when COVID was at its worst in the spring of 2020, the hospital that I'm at turned into a pure COVID hospital. So 300 beds in the hospital, every bed was occupied by a COVID patient, all COVID in the entire hospital. I'm in the North Shore, in the North Shore system, we have four hospitals dedicated to one hospital, to just COVID. And that was my hospital. So with the, during the summer of 2020, those numbers came down because uh, with the summer months, people were able to spread out a little bit more. And I can tell you that over the past three to six months, the number of patients that we're seeing in the hospital now on average is about 10. Again, every single one of those patients who's hospitalized with COVID, I would say over 90% who are hospitalized are patients who just did not have the vaccine. So what that tells me, again, my, I, I take care of probably a thousand patients with congestive heart failure. None of my patients who have been vaccinated have required hospitalization for COVID. Excellent. All right, and one more question um, for you. Is there a waiting period to receive a booster after you've had the infusion treatment? That's a very, that's a very, very good question. And you know what? The, the data is constantly moving on that. And I would, I would talk to an infectious disease doctor about that. I'm just a lowly plumber. Hey, uh, when I uh, went for my first uh, vaccine, uh, the, there was a questionnaire and one of them was, has it been 30 days or 90 days? And so um, I had to wait 90 days. And then after I had that uh, vaccine uh, in my left arm, my arm uh, swole up. And um, it, that was in uh, uh, July and it's still swollen to this day. Not as severe, but it's still swollen. I can't get it to come down. I've the second shot, no reaction. Yeah, now, I've seen that quite a bit with the boosters where people have had pretty intense local inflammatory response. And I don't think we have a real good idea as to why that is. As far as the waiting of three months or so after you've had COVID, the thought process is, is that you probably have some decent antibodies. That's one of the reasons that you can wait three months. Um, my my uh, 10 year old daughter, 10 to 11, she's gonna be 11 uh, in January. She actually had a COVID exposure uh, right before she was supposed to get her booster. So she was with a friend that was also 10 years old, who had really no symptoms. She was just screened at school and was positive. And then shortly after she was screened, she of course lost some taste and smell, but really had no real symptoms at all. And in those who have been exposed, the recommendation is to wait at least 10 days till you get your uh, vaccine. Really that's more about just trying to prevent the person who's giving you the vaccine from getting sick. So you're keeping your distance from the person who's giving you the vaccine. It's not that it's dangerous to get the vaccine after an exposure, nor is it dangerous to get the vaccine after, um, after you've had COVID. It's all interesting. It's such an interesting journey, this crazy life of COVID now, right? Um, so it is at the top of the hour and it has gone by really quick. I so appreciate everybody joining us. Um, I am going to just ask the panelists if you have one last bit of anything you'd like to say. I want to thank you for joining us. But Catherine, anything you want to say? Oh, I have lots of questions. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'll just say that, you know, I think one of the most important things is um, that everybody knows cool. to take precautions, which everybody knows that. But when someone gets sick, many of the symptoms are similar to other things, get tested. And then the number one thing that just bugged me the most is there wasn't enough emphasis on getting your um, oxygen level at home and how important it is to have that because I talked to three ER doctors and they said half the people that came to the ER had been at home forever with high fever, low oxygen levels, 
of which they did not know they had because they didn't have an oximeter and how important that is. So make sure if anybody you know has it, get them an oximeter if they don't have one because that right there, by the time they get to the hospital is what the doctors said, they were on their way out. You know, so, and you, we have to realize too, not everybody's educated enough to know. I never saw any list or anything that said, take your temperature, have an oximeter, do that so many times a day, do this, do that. I've never saw that list. Yeah. So I really think that's very, very important. So that's my two cents. But yeah, anyway. it's great advice. Marlon. I'm going to tag right along there. And uh, my advice is seek medical help sooner rather than later. It's, it's easy to delay it, as um, uh, Catherine said. And uh, the other thing I'd say is that, um, you know, the journey starts one step at a time. And uh, it is something that you have to be patient with and uh, to uh, accept and take, take your time. Uh, look for gradual, uh, gradual improvement as you go, rather than um, uh, we all like to have the magic bullet and have it be right now, but it doesn't always work that way. Great. Minty, any last words? Yeah, well, a funny story is uh, my wife says I bought her a pulse oximeter for her birthday. <laughs> they came in and I could, I, you know, I called the doctor after we had it like for a day and I said to him, I said, Alan, uh, Marilyn's reg registering like 91, 92. I'm in 67, 68, maybe 65 a little. And that's when he said, go to the hospital immediately. I, and I said, what's, you know, there must be something wrong. And when I was in the hospital, they had a hard time getting a, a reading on me. So I agree with you on the pulse doctor. And I had one really strange thing happen. I'm having a lot of tooth decay as a result of COVID. And my dentist says that he's hearing a lot of that now. Wow. And I don't, and I don't know if that's anything anybody else has had. The oxygen, the oxygen with the COVID. Wow. So. Stephanie, how about you? Yeah, I would say definitely don't wait to start some meds, even if it's just ibuprofen or whatever, um, stay on it. Take your pulse ox um, early and often, I think. Yeah, I, I learned that pretty quickly. And if you can get, I think, steroids, um, I think that really saved us a lot of um, trouble and heartache with our kiddo with um, CHD and asthma, um, we started nebulizing right away. So if you can do, um, yeah, and, and do be patient. I think even for myself, um, you know, I went back to work, but then I wound up relapsing that Thursday and I had to come back home and just sleep that whole day. Um, it does, it's a long crawl out um, for sure. And, you know, get vaccinated if you're not you know, champion it. I think we have a lot of people who um, are championing not to be vaccinated. And I get it, it's scary, it's new, but all of the data supports that, you know, the people who are not in the hospital are the vaccinated. Sick, yeah, maybe, possibly, um, but not hospitalized. And that's huge. It is huge to be able to stay home and be able to treat at home um, for your physical health, for your emotional health. Um, so I think that's a huge selling point um, to be vaccinated for sure. Great, and Dr. Robin, I am going to give you the last word before we close it out. Any last words or pieces of advice? So much of COVID has been politicized and it's, 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 it's bothersome. And I don't wanna make anyone feel bad for getting vaccinated or not getting vaccinated, but. I echo what Stephanie has to say that, that the, the best way for us to get out of this is for us to get vaccinated. And uh, I'm never going to force a patient to do so. We all have our own beliefs. And I respect that. Um, but I can tell you as someone who's was working in the trenches during the early months of this, we certainly do not want to see what I was seeing in the hospital back in the spring of 2020 ever again. Amen to that. All right. Yes, sure. Uh, Dr. Robin, do you advise your heart patients 
to take any type of vitamins like vitamin D, zinc, anything like that, that so many people have been really, yeah. yeah, yeah. There's really not very strong data that that's going to make okay. a major impact on your immune system. And yeah, most of us eat a very reasonable diet. And most of us get most of our vitamins. If you want to take a you know, multivitamin, whatnot for bone health and whatnot, okay. as far as the extras are concerned, probably not going to make much of a difference. Thanks very much. Right. Well, thank you, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate the time that you all took out of your day to join us. Um, for everybody who joined us listening, I hope you learned something. Uh, and I hope we opened up a continued conversation about how we can get through this together. So thank you all for joining us and everybody have a great night.